So like I said in my past few reviews, I've been on a little bit of a hiatus due to personal health issues, stuff like that, in and out of the hospital. Basically what I want to do today is a catch-up review of sorts. There's been a lot of movies and shows that I've seen over the past month, month and a half, that I just haven't been able to talk about, so I want to start doing that now. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to leave timestamps in the description below, just letting you know when I'm going to start talking about each specific movie or show. So if there's a specific one you don't really care for at all, you can just skip right to the ones you want. So these little short rapid fire reviews are just going to be a really shortened version of my opinions on the films. I'm not going to go fully in depth with the review or the plot, but I'm going to be doing one for the Umbrella Academy, Dumbo, Fighting With My Family, and a few others. So. Let's just get to it. First off, we have Dumbo. Now, Dumbo came out just a week or two ago and it's directed by Tim Burton. I was really excited when I saw this because I love Tim Burton, I love his work, Edward Scissorhands. I actually liked Miss Peregrine's Home and a lot of other of his classic films, Nightmare Before Christmas, I know he didn't direct someone else, but he created the characters, either way. So, I'm a huge Tim Burton fan, nevertheless. And after seeing this movie, I had to think to myself, this movie was very generic. I mean, the cast was generic. The special effects were there. There was a lot of times where I could just, I just could imagine this being done in the 90s and done better with practical effects at some points. But what keeps this movie alive is Tim Burton and, of course, he has his composer Danny Elfman back. And their combined charm is what kept this movie alive for me. I did kind of get a little nostalgic and kind of hit me right in the feels when I saw Michael Keaton and Danny DeVito interacting in a Tim Burton film with Danny Elfman scoring once again. All in one moment, I, I kind of lost my shit, I'm not going to lie. There's a decent chunk of this movie that's just completely similar to the original. And that's what I kind of hate about these modern Disney remakes. I Hate is a strong word, but I'm getting tired of because they don't go in a bold new direction. They kind of just rehash what's already been done and offer little to no new things to kind of draw us in. Obviously there's some stuff that they had to get rid of out of the original one, like all the racist shit that Disney originally had in the original film with the crows, and one of the crows was named Jim. Yeah, they took that shit out for obvious reasons. Again, like I said, Danny Elfman was composing this film and it just really took me back to when I was a kid and when I saw Tim Burton's movies for the first time. And they have this great chorus. Danny Elfman always has this haunting chorus of singers in his films. And it just gives you just a huge sense of awe and amazement whenever you see something. So props to Danny Elfman and Tim Burton for making that work once more. If it wasn't for Tim Burton and Danny Elfman's handprint on this film, it would just be another bland Disney film, very forgettable, so I can only honestly give this film a 5 out of 10. Alright, my next review is Fighting With My Family. So, this movie came out a little over a month ago, very end of February, and it stars Nick Frost, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and a few other up-and-coming actors. Also, I can't forget, Vince Vaughn was in this movie and he was excellent. So, this movie centers around a girl by the name of Paige, at least that's her wrestling name. Her and her brother are trying out for WWE, only one of them gets picked, and, well, if you've seen any of the posters or trailers, you know it's Paige. So what you get to see is all the hardships and all the just things that Paige has to deal with, not only with the WWE and trying to work to become one of the top wrestlers, but also family drama, the weight of the world on her shoulders and just trying to find her place to fit in. So Florence Pugh and Jack Loden are the actors and actresses who play Zach and Paige. And I really love their interaction. It's cool to see that even though they're brother and sister, they love each other, but they're still at each other's heads. I mean, sibling rivalry, it's inevitable. Another interesting aspect though is Nick Frost, his wife, uh, I think he's played by Lena Haiti in the film, they're a wrestling family too, so throughout all of the years, their family is just wrestlers at heart. Now, I loved wrestling when I was a kid. As I got older, it kind of faded away because I saw how fake and bogus it was, but I have a few friends who've kind of tried to sway me back into it, and watching this movie, I kind of get a little bit more into it because it's explained in the movie, and some of my friends even explained it too, that wrestling is basically just like any superhero or action film, it's a script, there's plot lines, but still, when you're acting and doing these things, they're actual stunts, for the most part, there's some fancy camera work involved, but 
they're still doing these backflips, doing all these tackles, head slams, choke slams, whatever you call it. And it's really cool to just see the behind the scenes look of this actual sport. If you saw any of the trailers for this film, you can guess that the best part of this movie is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I mean, hearing him spout out his lines from back in the 90s, early 2000s, when I watched WWE or WWF as it was back then, it just really hit close to home and just made this movie that much more enjoyable. Since it came out a little while ago, most likely the film is out of theaters now, but the director did confirm that when it comes on DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, whatever, there is gonna be an extended version, and I'm really excited for that because there was one specific character in the film I felt that he was just kind of random thrown in there, and looking back, I'm thinking to myself, they probably could have given him a little bit more to work with to make his character more significant, but guys, it was a huge surprise with this film. It was one of my most anticipated, but it really delivered 9.5 out of 10. All right, next up. So this movie was kind of surprised to me. I saw the trailer drop a month or two ago. I had no idea this movie was even in production, but Netflix's The Dirt, which is basically a movie adaptation of a book based on the band Motley Crue. So if any of you guys don't know, I'm a huge fan of Motley Crue. I've seen them in concert twice. I've listened to their music for years. And I love metal. I love every different kind of metal for the most part. So I was really pumped to see these trailers and I was so happy to watch this movie a few weeks ago. If you haven't heard of Motley Crue, you should really get educated because there's a lot of dark shit that happened with this band. They dealt with drugs, murder, um, a lot of other just real themes, all because of the effect of alcohol, drugs, and a lot of other careless stuff that they did. So of course, the movie was about the music, but a lot of other music biopics, they might delve a little bit into the dark areas of these musicians, but not like this movie did. All right, so let's kick it off with the cast. Daniel Weber, who you might have recognized from 112263 or the Punisher Netflix series, plays Vince Neil in this movie and he kills it as Vince Neil. Not even just the party version of Vince Neil that everyone's used to, but there's some sad, dark, deep shit to his character and he does a really good job with it. The actors who played Nikki Six and Mick Mars, I didn't recognize from anything else. I think the dude who played Mick Mars might have been in a Marvel property, either like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or that uh, short-lived Inhuman show. I know it was one of them. Uh, Tommy Lee. Now, Tommy Lee, the guy who played him, I was really surprised by because it was Machine Gun Kelly, of all people. And I'm not usually a big fan of him because he had that whole thing trying to say he was better than Eminem and the whole retaliation. And I thought his character and acting was trash in Bird Box. So my expectations were really low when I heard he was playing the character. But he killed it, honestly. It, it seemed like completely different than how he was in real life. And he's just a party animal in this, and he's a fun character, very likable character. Whenever you see his character on screen, you know it's gonna be one hell of a time. What I also loved is it shows the band through the decades. It's not just like the first few years of their life when they were really popular, but throughout their entire life, 70s, 80s, 90s, when they were kids, uh, 20 year olds like me, and even into their 30s and very early 40s. I think early 40s. Well, Either way, throughout all of their musical careers, you get to see them interacting with some famous musicians in this film. I was just really surprised because I do know a lot about the band, but some shit that happened in the movie, I was like, shit, yeah, yeah that happened. What, that happened too, holy, wow. Most of the stuff that happened in the film did happen in real life. I mean, there's certain things in the movie uh, there was a moment where they had to get the rights back to their music, and I know probably it wasn't that easy to get their rights back, but in the film it was portrayed like that. And um, something that happened with Vince Neil's character in the movie happened the same day that Tommy Lee met the actress Heather Locklear, and it didn't happen in the same day in real life, but I mean, it's a movie. You have to compress shit to make a quality film. I didn't have too many negatives, honestly. There were certain scenes where Vince Neil was singing or the band is drumming, and just the track that they dubbed over it seemed a little bit off, and Vince Neil singing just seemed a little bit off. Maybe they could have taken some of his older recordings, live recordings, and kind of mixed it in, or when they're doing their first sort of rehearsal as a band they're in this room and it just sounds like a track that they played over top of everything it doesn't sound like there's reverb or anything like that or 
I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed off to me. One last thing. It, it's kind of a personal thing. My favorite song by Motley Crue is Wild Side and it wasn't in there. I was like, oh, come on. This is definitely one of the more enjoyable biopics that came out. I think fans of Motley Crue and people who don't really know too much about them will definitely enjoy this film. 8.5 out of 10. So let's dive into the TV shows that I've been watching. Umbrella Academy. Now, I was a little hesitant because... It just seemed like a very generic show, another Netflix binge watch, quick season that's just mediocre. I watched the first episode and it, it was interesting. I wasn't impressed that much, but as I got more and more into the show, I got more and more invested in these characters and that's where the strongest point in this show is, the characters. The Umbrella Academy was about a group of kids who were all together using their superpowers to fight off bad guys, but as time went on, they sort of separated and went their own ways. But something draws them back all these years later to kind of meet up and see where we're at again. The only two actors or actresses I really recognize from this is Ellen Page, who was from X-Men and Juno. You also had Robert Sheehan, who played Klaus. And his character was just really fun and interesting because his power is... He can communicate with the dead, but only when he's sober because he does a lot of drugs. So... What made this character interesting to me is he's struggling with addiction and all of these crazy thoughts that are going around in his head. He doesn't know if it's because he's sober or not sober and he hates it. So he wants to drink and do drugs as much as he can to tune out all of these voices in his head. The rest of the cast did a great job too. The characters had very unique powers. The way they do these characters though is really great and that's what saves the show because the plot in a whole is very generic. We've seen this plot a million times before in other superhero films. Someone teleports to the future, sees that the future's in danger, comes back and says, hey guys, I saw some shit in the future. We have to save the world and prevent it from happening in four days. There's a group in the Legends of Tomorrow TV show called the Time Bureau, and they're basically making sure that all this bad shit doesn't happen. People trying to mess with the timeline, make sure they don't interfere, and make sure that no one basically sees these time apparitions or whatever you like to call them. And in this show, they basically had the same exact thing. So that's why it didn't feel like that new of a thing to me. But again, the characters and the tone of this film is what saved it. Not to mention the soundtrack for this TV show is phenomenal. Gerard Way from My Chemical Romance handpicked most of the songs himself and they just flow really well with the tone. and. It's a fun time, I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot of secrets to get revealed, a lot of twists and turns, a few predictable plot elements, but the one thing that kind of threw me off about this whole show is the fact that since time travel is involved, if a character dies or an important event happens, it's not set in stone. I know there is, like I said, this Time Bureau type of agency in this TV show trying to prevent stuff like that from happening, but it just leaves stuff kind of open-ended. And that's how I feel about certain DC or Marvel or Doctor Who properties where if someone dies, I'm just like, but did they really die? Nevertheless, the final episode ended on such a cliffhanger. And guys, if you get past the first episode and keep watching after episode two or three, it really gets interesting and the characters just really suck you in. So not a perfect show by any means, but a solid first season, 7.5 out of 10. So the last show I want to talk about is, I saw the first season of this a few months back. Well, I guess you would say the first part, I don't know, first season, book one, book two. So the second book or season came out recently, probably about a month and a half, two months ago. And I binge watched that in one day. It's great because all the episodes are basically a half hour. So... This show is done by the same people who did the animated series of Avatar The Last Airbender, The Legend of Korra, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure they're working on a live action version of The Last Airbender on Netflix now, but The Dragon Prince is just an amazing show. The animation, it's a little bit jarring at first because it's the modern day animation where they do a little bit of the 3D thing at first, so it was a little bit off-putting, but I kind of got used to it. it, grew on me. This show is about two brothers, Callum and Ezrin, and they basically make an unlikely alliance with an elf assassin named Rayla. Rayla was originally sent to kill them, but she has a change of heart, so they embark on this epic quest to return a dragon egg and restore peace to all the land. So the end of season one, beginning of season two, it's a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen the first season, but sorry, season two just came out. So 
the dragon egg hatches. So they're trying to teach this little dragon how to fly and throughout the whole season, it's really cool just to see this dragon grow and it, it feels like a character. So Ezrin is really trying to teach this dragon how to become what it's truly meant to be. Callum's trying to learn more magic, but what he really finds out is there's a light side and a dark side to everything. So you see them explore both sides of that in this season. If you're wondering, does it match up to Avatar The Last Airbender? I, I can't really say that because Avatar The Last Airbender, the TV series is perfect. But this is very close to that. I like it better than Legend of Korra. And what I like about this is Legend of Korra actually, I think they canceled it a few episodes before it was about to finish. I think it was because there were some sort of mature themes, more mature than your average seven, eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid who watches Nickelodeon. And so the last few episodes aired on their website. Now, this is on Netflix, so they're free to do whatever they want. And that doesn't mean they're going to say shit, pit, like any of these curse words or have sexual themes or anything like that. But it, it just means they're free to not have any restrictions. There's one scene in particular you see a really cool epic battle and it shows off these two lesbian queens. And some people are for or against, whatever, not my business. But they portray it in a way where it doesn't focus, it's just natural and that's what I like. It should just be natural in a movie. It, it shouldn't be focused on like it's held right in front of your face. It should just be depicted the way it was. And they're both total badasses. And what they do in this season, what they do in flashbacks is really critical to the main plot and where the kingdoms are as they stand today. And at one point there was a Lord of the Rings reference in season two. I, I nerded out, I lost my shit. Just like any epic tale, there has to be a bad guy or bad guys. And for a lot of this season, you don't know if they're fully bad. There's a few characters who are pawns of a higher up bad guy. And so these characters start to question what's right, what's wrong. And it adds a lot of depth to these cartoon characters, believe it or not. And holy shit, the finale of this season. I was looking, I was like, where's the next? No, it was the last episode. So, unfortunately, it does leave on a crazy cliffhanger and builds up so much lore that I know is going to be expanded in the next season. And they did confirm season three of WonderCon, so we're going to get a third season. You guys, don't sleep on this show. If you think it's childish or... It's not. It's meant for people of all ages, and it might be even geared towards teenagers and adults more than little kids. Not that there's any really bloody grotesque violent stuff in here but like i said there's just some themes that feel like they're more teenager adult related please check out this show on netflix it's my favorite thing out there right now season one and season two were perfect 10 out of 10. so there we are we're all caught up for the most part there's a few things that i'm still trying to binge through to kind of catch up with everyone because i know eventually if i don't watch it as soon as possible i'm gonna get that shit spoiled one way or another so there you have it guys let me know what you've been watching lately and as always Thanks for watching.